Okay, so welcome to the Tri-Cities All Candidates Climate Debate. Um, my name is Nancy Furness and I'll be moderating the first half of the debate tonight. So I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that we are on unceded Coast Salish territory and I'm going to turn it over to Pris Priscilla Omulo to um, open the event for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, like Nancy said, my name is Priscilla Mulo. I am a visitor here on the um, Coast Salish Coquitlam Territory, and I'm from Sartlip, which is Vancouver Island. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening, and I just would like to encourage everyone to go into this event with open hearts and open minds, as today we are speaking of something that's very important. I'm pretty sure to all of you as well for being here this evening. Um, as an Indigenous person, we find that land and water is something that's very sacred to us. So I find this event to be something that's very important for myself personally as well. So um, please do um, be feel free to ask your questions to all these candidates because I think it's a very important moment for us to be able to really get clarity before we step into the uh, polling boxes. So, hi Chika. Hi Chika. Okay, so thank you Priscilla for that. Um, tonight's debate is one of 100 plus similar events that are being held across the country. And I believe that the current climate crisis will end up being the defining issue of this election. So tonight we have our candidates from both Tri-Cities ridings here, and they're going to have the opportunity to share with us their plan for protecting our future and for mitigating the effects of climate change. So I would like to thank Douglas College for providing the venue for tonight's debate. Also Tri-Cities Community TV for being with us. Our amazing group of volunteers who brought the event together and a special shout out to Warren Wilkinson and to Ben Perry for making sure that this event took place. I'd also like to thank each of our um, candidates for putting themselves out there and doing what they truly believe is best for the Tri-Cities. And then last but certainly not least to all of you for staying engaged and for making informed decisions when you go out to place your vote. Um, now I also want to be clear that um, the Conservative candidates were invited to attend this event as well. Um, however, both Nicholas Inslee and um, Nellie Shin declined to uh, participate in this event. So I'm going to quickly run through how we envision tonight um, unfolding. On each of your spots, you should have found an agenda, and we'll just quickly run through that. So to start off, we're going to ask each of our candidates to introduce themselves, and they'll have a maximum of one minute to do that. Following that, uh, they will answer a series of uh, four questions. They'll have one minute maximum to answer each of those questions. And those questions were provided to them ahead of time, so they've had an opportunity to look at those questions and think about their responses. The order in which they respond is randomized for fairness. Um, and then once they've answered those questions, we're going to take a 10 minute break. During that break, uh, we ask that you look on the back of your agenda. There's a question form. If you could please fill that out with your burning questions, tear that off and bring it down to the front desk as quickly as you can. There's um, extra pens and forms down here if you need them. Um, and then those questions will be prioritized. So they'll form the basis for the second half of our debate. At the end of the questions, our candidates will be given one minute to do a wrap up and to tell us why we should vote for them. And with that, we will end the debate. Uh, we do have a timekeeper here, so there will be a green card. When they hold that up, you're good to go. The yellow card means you've got 10 seconds, so please think about wrapping up. And a red card means you're out of time and we will need to move on to the next candidate. So just please be aware of that. Um, and so the last thing that we need to talk about is <coughs> washrooms. Should you need to use them, up through that door, turn to your right and head down to the first hallway for the men's, the second hallway to the right for the women's. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get started. 
Um, we're going to get the candidates to introduce themselves, and I'll ask just for the sake of time, if you could hold your applause until all the introductions are done. So we're going to start with our first introduction, is Sarah Battier, from the, uh, the Liberal candidate from Port Moody, Coquitlam. Like this? It's okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Battier. Coquitlam's been my home for the past 15 years. I love taking my daughter to Bunsen Lake and White Pine Beach, and I wonder every time I go whether she's going to be able to share that with her kids. I started my career as an engineer 12 years ago at BC Hydro, but because I was a refugee when I was growing up, I really wanted to work in disaster response and humanitarian aid. So I spent many years working with Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross, and I saw the impacts of climate change all around the world. Uh, most recently, I was an energy specialist at the World Bank. I was designing large large solar energy programs for millions of people uh, who are currently using it today, and I advise the most senior levels of government, including ministers of energy on the green energy transition. I want to use that decade plus year of experience right here in the Tri-Cities for our community and for Canada. My voice will be respected at the decision-making table. My name is Sarah Badia, and this is a fight that is too important to not follow through all the way to the end, and I want to be your champion for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and we'll go on to our, our next candidate, Jason Chabot, the People's Party of Canada for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Hi, my name is Jason, a Port Moody, Coquitlam candidate representing the People's Party of Canada. You know, forgive me, I'll be reading from my notes for this part. Based on the uh, 100 debates on the environment questions, we'll be covering a lot, a range of topics this evening, but for now I'd just like to point out that I work in the uh, food distribution industry where we're always ahead of the game when it comes down to food trends relating to the environment. Uh, before they're released to the general public, we were responsible for ensuring items like paper straws, starch-based cutlery, wooden cutlery, compostable takeout containers, bamboo cups, along with plant-based products like burgers and chicken were available. Well, the chicken needs some work. Uh, last year, our food show, like a car show or an RV show, but with food, successfully diverted 100% of all of our waste from the landfill. We also play key roles in crisis situations like resolving the avian flu involving chicken. Please understand, my professional career is dependent on exceeding the demands of my boss, namely the customer. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And our next one will be Christina Gower, NDP candidate for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Hi, everybody. Um, I am employed as a registered psychiatric nurse at um, Royal Columbian Hospital in the ER. I uh, became a nurse as an activist um, to learn actually where we're uh, failing our most vulnerable people uh, and lobby government um, after I learned the ropes and where our gaps are in the system and there's plenty uh, and I did do that. Um, I also have been a housing uh, advocate and activist um, having organized the first uh, affordable housing rally in British Columbia. Uh, I, joined Greenpeace when I was 20, that's 27 years ago, um, when it was a radical move actually, and it was something that uh, I didn't actually tell a lot of people back then, but I did send them a check every single uh, month, which um, I could barely afford then, and it's still tough now these days. Um, so I am really, I just want to say a brief thing about the environment to me. I've spent many vacations, most of my vacations, trekking in the backcountry. Uh, and I've always been very concerned for wildlife um, and I wanted, you know, I used to worry about preserving that for, for recreation, but I never thought we would come to this point where we now need to worry about um, mass destruction of climate change. So I'm really thankful to the organizers for doing this debate tonight and bringing it uh, to the forefront of all of our thoughts. Okay. Um, thank you, thank Christina. You. Time up. I didn't look at the red card, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and next we're going to move on to Bryce Watts, um, Green candidate from Port Moody, Coquitlam. Hello, I'm Bryce Watts. I'm an anthropologist, a small business owner, and a lifelong environmentalist. This election, each and every one of us has the choice and the opportunity to break the mold of our political system. We can fight against the status quo of going back and forth between the liberal and conservative governments who seem to tell us that those are the only voices that this country has to offer. I saw it in the climate marches weeks ago, and I see it on your doorsteps and in the community when I meet you all in person. We 
all address that climate change is the number one issue on all of our minds, and we need to elect leaders who are actually going to get something done. I know that one voice can seem like it can't make a difference, and that one vote cannot make a difference. But I'm here to tell you today that if we can unite our voices, we can overcome anyone that seems to want to keep us divided and that wants to keep us in our place so the status quo can continue and that corporations can continue to make money off of the pollution of our national environment. We have the opportunity to make real change. Thank you. Thank you, Bryce. And next, we're going to go to Benita Zarillo, NDP candidate for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. The outcome of this fall's election will determine whether or not we hurt or we help the warming of this planet. It will determine if income inequality will continue to grow or whether it will recede. And it will also determine whether we will have life-saving drugs for everyone or just a few. Overall, we're going to determine through this election what, what our govern, how our country will be governed by the next four years and under what values. My name is Benita Zarillo. I'm a three-term city councillor and I'm running to be the next member of parliament for Port Moody, Coquitlam, and more in Belcara. Uh, the residents of Port Moody, Coquitlam, and more in Belcara are committed to uh, the well-being of their neighbours, but also this planet. And I've heard on the doorstep that they want to protect the, the way of life for residents, but they also have a very strong desire to protect the well-being of nature. They're committed to that, they're asking for that, and I'm committed to that too. My record in government is strong. I'm known for my uh, integrity and transparency. We have a very short window to do something about this climate crisis and we need a member of parliament that can hit the ground running, that has the experience, they know what to do and they can solve these, uh, thank these you. problems quicker than uh, they have done. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Benita. Thank you. Um, and next up we have Brad Nickerson, a green candidate from Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, I am Brad Nickerson for the Green Party in Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Um, something that's really disturbing me in this entire election is uh, the issue of th the Greens are seeming to be uh, characterized as alarmism. And we hear it in greenwashing that's going on with other parties who are very concerned about this, but they're tied into corporations and unions that will hold them back. So I want to play a little game. I saw this today. Um, I want you to listen for the five categories of, disis of climate misinformation tonight. It's not real. It's not us. It's not bad. The experts are unreliable. Climate solutions won't work. Their goal is to slow walk this issue. We don't have time to slow walk it. Um, there's also going to be the chicken little catastrophe argument. Maybe we ought to do something, but we don't want to destroy the economy and cause millions of job losses and send the entire world into a depression. It's a delay tactic. Kay. We need to deal with this now. Thank you, Brad. Next up, we have Ron McKinnon, Liberal candidate for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Well, hello. My name is Ron McKinnon, and I have the honor to uh, be running in this election under the banner of the uh, Liberal Party of Canada to uh, represent this riding in the next election. For the past four years, it has been my privilege to be your member of parliament, to advocate for you and, and represent your best interests. I've long been a tireless advocate for equality, fairness and inclusion. I, I became involved in politics because I wanted to be involved in the decisions that affected my family and my community. I wanted to put empathy into politics and turn its focus to the least privileged among us. We know that climate change is real and happening right now. In fact, we have already declared a climate emergency. And I'm committed to protecting the environment and fighting climate change. This means switching to clean energy, pricing pollution, protecting our oceans and wild places, and banning harmful single-use plastics. We are, in fact, the only party that is taking actual comprehensive action to tackle the climate crisis. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ron. Um, thank you to all the candidates for your introductions.
Okay, we're going to move right into our first question now. And um, for these questions, we're looking for what you, as an individual MP, would do to help solve these environmental challenges. We're looking for you to go beyond stating what your party has done or will do. In your initial response to these questions, we ask that you avoid talking about what other parties are or are not doing. Um, and our first question concerns climate change. Um, what are the key elements of an action plan that you will advocate for to ensure Canada meets its international obligations to reduce greenhouse gas or GHG pollution? And we're going to start with Christina Gower. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, you have one minute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so we have a very bold $15 billion plan that confronts the climate crisis uh, and limits warming to um, one and a half degrees. Um, personally, uh, I, I, we, we need more trees. <laughs> That's a huge thing that I'm going to be advocating for in Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Um, we've seen the clear cutting and, and the uh, building up of Burke Mountain. We've seen the detriment to the wildlife that has happened from that. Um, that is a personal uh, issue that I, I take very dear to heart. I hate seeing the animals destroyed um, because they're doing what they naturally, um, well, unnaturally do, uh, just seeking food in a, in a populated area. So I would like to find ways to mitigate what we've already done. Um, I would like to advocate very much for alternate uh, transportation uh, modes um, other than cars. Uh, we have a lot of people crammed into a small space in a very fast time without the ex without infrastructure um, there, and people are staying in their cars because transit is not accessible. Um, uh, very much would like to see more bike paths because I'm a cyclist. Thank you, Christine. Thanks. And we're going to move on to Ron McKinnon. Okay, so as individual MPs work through parties, so to do to, what an individual MP is going to do is going to work with his party and with the whole parliament and the various committees. Um, what we have been doing for the past four years is moving forward on an aggressive agenda to uh, combat climate change. We have the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and ch climate change with all of the provinces, which uh, commits all of the provinces to a price on pollution, phasing out methane emissions, um, phasing out coal power, uh, electrical generation, developing and, and uh, implementing uh, renewable power, and, and many things like that. We, we are committed going forward to, to continuing that, that effort. We are um, investing, we're going to be planting two billion trees over the next 10 years, we're investing in, inf in transport, uh, transportation infrastructure, in, in uh, electric cars. We're building out a 5,000 uh, station uh, electric charging network across the country. Um, net zero building codes and so on and so forth. Thank you, Ron. Um, and just a reminder to candidates that you can move that microphone in front of you to make sure that everybody can hear you. Um, our next up, we have Benita Zarillo. Well, there's three things I've been working on as a, a city councillor, so I'm going to continue on those. The first one is the oil and gas subsidies. So it's been my work on council to identify how much subsidies each of the Coquitlam taxpayers has been paying to host the Kinder Morgan pipeline. That has gone all the way through FCM up to the National Energy Board, and it was actually Coquitlam that was part, part of a task force recently with the oil and gas industry um, until they decided that we were moving too fast and they had to pull the plug. But I will continue to advocate uh, against subsidies. Number two, microplastics. I've been working on cigarette butt free in this community for many, many years. Those are microplastics, those uh, filters. I'm going to be working on that and expand it into the th single use plastics. The other thing is I'm well known in this community uh, for my stance on gender equality. The, one of the parts of the uh, NDP plan is to have a climate, uh, Canadian Climate Bank, which I think will be much more successful than the Infrastructure Bank. Um, I'm hoping that this will f funnel down to women in our community so that they can uh, have small business locally and uh, we'll have what can reduce, reduce their commutes to pick Kay. up children. Thank you, Benita. Those are the three things. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move to Sarah Badier. Honestly, it's really hard to cover in one minute all the things that I'd like to cover, but uh, I'll get started. And I want to talk about the uh, 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 plan for the Liberal Party to cut corporate taxes 
for uh, companies that create uh, uh, zero emission uh, technologies by 50%. Uh, when I was working in Gaza, uh, I remember there was a lot of diesel power generation that was being used. Um, the, the, the prices for solar panels and batteries have dropped by 80% over the last 10 years. So I designed large-scale rooftop solar energy programs and, and basically what it meant was that hospitals and schools and millions of people um, had access to clean energy supply. Usually fuel uh, from diesel goes to fund mafias and wars. What we can do is export this technology uh, design it here in Canada. Um, as your MP, I'd like to go to um, uh, Ottawa, bring that money here, create a clean tech hub here in our own city, the same way as other MPs have been able to do in Burnaby North. I would like to bring that money here and create clean tech jobs and then export that. That is the way that we move away from fossil fuels. We have reduced the subsidies to fossil fuels already. We're investing into the sector. I'm a specialist in that area. And Thank I'd like you, to keep Sarah. That going. And we're going to move right along here to Jason Chabot. I, I hope I can beg for just five seconds of everyone's time to acknowledge the Honourable Member of Parliament, Finn Donnelly. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you. The, the PPC platform puts an emphasis back on providing clean air, water and soil, repudiates the Paris Climate Accord, and does not support the consensus viewpoint that CO2 is pollution. RealClimateScience.com, Tony Heller notes the failure rate of computer models to predict temperature. Scientists at ClimateChangeReconsidered.org have signed a document saying that sun is the main driver of climate change, not you, not CO2. The danger of consensus science is illustrated by Einstein, who after being confronted by 100, student, 100 scientists regarding the theory of relativity famous responded, why 100? It only takes one. Randombio.com, TJ Nelson, cold facts on global warming illustrated absorption by light uh, uh, by CO2 along the electromagnetic spectrum is minimal, showing that 90% of absorption is primarily by water vapor. Thank you, Jason. And we're going to move along next to Bryce Watts. The first thing I'll do once being elected to Ottawa is going to be working with Elizabeth May to create a cross-party inter-cabinet, inner-cabinet dealing specifically with climate change. We cannot think of the climate crisis in four-year increments. It's not going to solve itself in four years, and we cannot have the work that we do in four be undone in the next four. So we have to have every party on board, or else it will never be a solution that's going to last. The next thing I would like to put my energy to is addressing the growing concern of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by our food industry. The top five meat and dairy companies in the world surpass Exxon, BP, and Shell in their emissions every year. By addressing this silent emissions producer, everyone knows the fossil fuels, we need to tackle that, but our food system is also something that we need to tackle and find a way to get it on board to reduce its emissions as well. Because our climate crisis is not one industry, it's every industry has to do its part to reduce emissions. Thank you, Bryce. Um, next, we have Brad Nickerson. Um, I, too, like Bryce, uh, believe in the, uh, the cross-party council that will work to make sure that all parties begin to take this um, issue seriously, but working together. One of the things that I feel strongest about is the, the issue in Parliament where we see the total disrespect for one another so many times. And I would like to see people working together in Parliament, working on councils that deal with the most important issue of our time. A second thing that would be very close to me is to uh, work against all pipelines, whether that be a pipeline that carries bitumen or a pipeline that carries LNG. Both of these things are against what we need to do for the future of our children. Um, I'm, I'm also very interested, as Christine said, in transit in our areas. It, we see in the Tri-Cities a huge difficulty of people getting to transit, and I'd like to see that solved for our area. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, thank you, all candidates, for your responses. And we're going to move right into our next question. So this question... <laughs> This question is to do with water. What can the federal government do to work with different sectors like municipalities and farmers 
to reduce both water pollution and the risk of flood events which have been aggravated by industrial development and climate change. And first up, we're going to ask Benita Zarillo. Thank you for the question, and this certainly does impact um, the riding not just of Port Moody Coquitlam, but also Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. So I'm going to start talking again about the cigarette butts and the microplastics. So that's something that can definitely be done, be done at the municipal, municipal level, is to protect our streams and our oceans from that uh, microplastic. The next thing is this uh, idea of resources. We have dikes in this, these two ridings, and those dikes are in need of maintenance, and there's actually quite a bit of the diking that's along private property, which is right now the responsibility of private property owners if we have flooding events. So we need resources from the federal government to help municipalities manage that. At this point in time, it's going to come on the municipal tax dollars, so that's definitely something that we can do and we should do. Also, more wind storms and storm water, we need we need uh, advocates on the ground that understand how much this is costing municipalities and farmers and be able to advocate for it. And lastly, I just want to say that the federal government also needs to get some enforcement resources for the, the development that was spoken about. There's no oversight you, at this point Benita. of time on that. Sorry. Thank you. And we're going to move next to Brad Nickerson. So in the Green Party, we believe that water is sacred and uh, it is our responsibility um, to, to make sure that we have safe drinking water and it needs to be um, treated well. Uh, something that we can do in order to, to uh, help water in our communities is plant trees. And we're seeing that around the world, the, the importance of trees as a way to fight carbon emission. That's something that we can do right here. And the benefits to our water sources is immense in that sense. They clean our water as well as bring us uh, oxygen and many other benefits to communities. Thank you, Brad. And we'll go next to Jason Chabot. Well, there's a lot to be addressed here. Uh, flooding relates back to the land use, and one item that, not, that is not mentioned about there is the agricultural land that is now drained by tile drain. Uh, the practice of putting pipes in the ground for the purpose of draining all the water towards waterways. It's not just about dealing with hard services around waterways, it's about dealing with hard services in general. Um, the, it's about being able to keep up with the demand and have sufficient planning so that when we design our landscaping, we are using that uh, effort instead of focusing so much on CO2. Uh, regarding the statistics regar about the uh, Insurance Bureau stating that 250% increase in damages, insurance companies explain the statistic by pointing out that since the 70s, homeowners are finishing their basements and putting considerable amount of wealth below the surface, especially in floodplains. And that the cost of these claims are increasing, not because of flooding, but because simply more wealth is being destroyed. Thank you, Jason, and we'll go to Christina Gower. Um, I think I'll focus uh, right now on fisheries. Uh, the open net fish farms, um, I think, is something that we would like to transition out of very quickly uh, and move them inland. Um, uh, we'd also, I would love to work with the, the ships fishing, uh, all the um, cruise ships that are coming in. We need to start looking at what the sewage and the waste that's going into our water uh, and our water treatment systems uh, around that as well. Um, and just so you know, the NDP does have a $40 million coastal protection fund to clean up the coasts and rehabilitate the fish habitats. That includes putting in the Cohen, uh, all the recommendations of the Cohen Commission uh, regarding restoring sockeye um, in our rivers and um, placing also stronger, we want to place labels on seafood so that you can tell where it's been, where it came from, make sure it's sustainable uh, and trace, trace it uh, back to uh, its source. Um, we want to invest in habitat, habitat restoration and rebuilding of the fish stocks and Thank ocean Thank you, science. Christina. Thank you. And we're going to go next to Ron McKinnon. Oh, sorry, Ron. So in our platform, we have committed to create a Canada Water Agency to work with uh, provinces and territories, indigenous communities, scientists, local authorities, and so forth to uh, to identify best ways to keep our fresh waters safe and clean. We're also committed in, through our infrastructure programs to support and, uh, and help fund water treatment facilities and wastewater treatment facilities uh, around the country. 
In fact, we have already committed, uh, I think, $150 million or so to the Lionsgate um, uh, waste treatment plant here. Um, this means that, that the water that's being discharged into the ocean is cleaner and, and uh, um, that needs to be upgraded actually even further for, ter for tertiary treatment so we can get more of the, more of the things like microplastics and uh, um, uh, pharmaceuticals and so forth out of the water. We need to do that all up and down the coast. We need to do that inland. We need to, we need to encourage more communities to do water treatment because one of the, we here have the, one of the best sources Thank of you, water Ron. in the world. <laughs> Sorry, we'll move next to Sarah Badier. Um, so I have some good news. A lot of the recommendations that were suggested already are already being done or on our platform. So we have a one and a half billion dollar oceans protections plan that's already been impl implemented. It's the biggest investment in oceans in Canadian history and it's supporting a lot of the habitats and uh, protection of our waterways that um, uh, you guys were talking about. Um, on our platform we already have the plan to plant two billion trees and in addition uh, to move to closed containment systems for, for fish farming. Um, and, and what you were talking about, Benita, in terms of dikes and um, the need for um, controlling against floods. Um, if you take a look at the Canadian Centre for Climate Services, which we've set up, it's got all kinds of data uh, for city planners and, and municipal folks so that they can um, plan for their city specifically what kind of mitigation mechanisms they want because we believe it's a bottom-up approach. Every municipality has their own unique solutions. So through the $2 billion Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, we will provide the money for the municipalities for their own custom solutions to be able to go out and create uh, flood mitigation systems. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. And now we'll go to Bryce Watts. Wetlands are the natural filtration systems of the Canadian environment, and so we need, as a federal government, to work with municipalities, farms, private landholders, and the provincial governments to ensure that we restore these wetlands maintain them and also create new ones in city parks and on agricultural land to ensure that the runoff that does occur, which we cannot fight against, is filtered out and does not make its way into our streams with our fish and into the coasts around BC. We also need to, as Sarah and Bernita have mentioned, look at the infrastructure we have for our canals and dike systems. Flooding will occur and it is going to get worse with increased rainfall every year. We need to make sure that these are adequate for what we are seeing now and also adequate for the increased rainfall that we're expecting in the coming years. The next thing we need to do is look at our riparian areas around our streams and rivers. Erosion is happening and with increased rainfall it will increase the amount of runoff going into our streams. Each of these issues are going to increase the amount of soil and aggregates going in and destroying our fish stocks. We need thank to look you at Bryce. Um, thank you all the candidates for your answers to that question. We're going to move on to our third question of the evening, and it's to do with wilderness conservation. What will you do to protect the quality and quantity of wilderness in Canada? And we're going to hear from Jason Chabot first. One of the things by taking the onus off of carbon and putting it back onto environmental preservation will actually be the increasing of green space. Uh, this is illustrated right now as in the Amazon rainforest where controlled burns are being done to clear land to grow corn so we can turn it into ethanol and fight the climate emergency myth. So we're falling forests to counter the idea that CO2 is pollution. Drawing attention to ecological impact of wind turbines whose massive blades are killing birds, many rare birds, is important. Instead of massive blade structures, we should look at spiral turbines, for example, that are not only visually pleasing, but are also bird friendly. Thank you, Jason. Um, next, we'll move on to Bryce. The federal government needs to start working with researchers, Parks Canada, and private landowners to identify ecologically rich zones of our country to protect. Biodiversity is protected around the world, 80% of it, by indigenous communities. We need to work with the indigenous communities in Canada to ensure that these rich ecosystems are maintained for future use. We also need to work with the DFO to identify more marine protected areas. 
Our coasts are vital, especially in BC. Our rainforests are literally fertilized by the salmon that call our rivers and streams homes. The DFO needs to identify these areas and we need to increase the amount of protected areas so that these vital fish stocks are maintained. Finally, we need to advocate for a closed system for fish farming. Open net fish farms, we all read in the news, create disease, spread diseases and spread sea lice to our wild stocks and cause a decline in salmon year upon year. If we can make a shift to closed systems, we can limit the amount of impact that we are having on these wild stocks. Thank you, Bryce. Next, we'll go to Ron McKinnon. Thank you. In our uh, last campaign, we committed to uh, protecting, uh, I forget the number, I think 15% of our wild spaces, of our uh, oceans. 17%, um, I think it was. Uh, at that time, only 1% had been protected. Uh, that number is actually up to 14.3% at this point. Uh, in this campaign, as we go forward, we, we are upping the uh, ante on those uh, commitments. We are committing to protecting 25% of uh, land uh, terrestrial areas, wild terrestrial areas by 2025, and 25% of ocean areas by 2025 as well. And to go further to uh, 2030, to protect 30% of ocean areas and, in, uh, and um, uh, land areas as well. We understand that wilderness is important. Wilderness is important for our way of life and for our, for our uh, uh, not way of life, but for our quality of life. Uh, I know that I remember as a child being taken out of school to go fishing in the wilderness, and it, it will always stick with me. Thank you, Ron. Um, next, we'll go to Benita Zarillo. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably have to take my minute to recognize uh, MP Donnelly here. Um, uh, just got into law the shark fin ban. And if we talk about what uh, an MP can do on the quantity and quality of wilderness in Canada, I think it should be recognized. So. Thank you, uh, MP Donnelly. And the other thing I, I have to I have to say it, uh, MP Donnelly um, ha put forward in tr 2010 a private member's bill about moving the wild salmon um, from the open net salmon farms to land base, and I believe it was twice denied uh, by the two successive governments. So I just want to share that. I know we're supposed to stay away from it. Also wanted to say about the riparian areas and the dikes that have been talked about here. I'm on the ground. I, I know how this works. You need budgets for it. We need to have it prioritized. Uh, the NDP, um, they will have 30% of land protected by the year 2030 and uh, looking at an environmental bill of rights and we're gonna do it. Thank you, Benita. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move next to Brad Nickerson. S um, Ethical wisdom or ecological wisdom is a, hu uh, is a core value of the Green Party. Uh, humans and species of plants and animals are integrated in independent parts of a living planet. Degrading one damages um, life as a whole. This is both an ethical and practical issue. So as a Green Party, what we would like to do is um, have a close partnership with indigenous people relying on traditional ecological knowledge bring them um, into this as partners, as, fully, uh, as full partners. Personally, what I would like to do in Ottawa is uh, advocate uh, for awareness with regards to the, the, the sheer number of species that have disappeared on our planet in the last 40 years and the number of, our, the number of animals, 50% of all animals on our planet have disappeared and turned into cows. I think that more people need to understand that that's what's going on. Thank you, Brad. Um, Christina. So um, I think probably my, my number one thing that I would want to start working on would be our forestry practices. Right now there are herbicides used that prevent biodiversity uh, and increase in my opinion, um, the tinder dry forests that we see burning in our forest fires as, as uh, we go through these drought um, flood sort of scenarios that have been happening more recently. Um, we also, and I support the creation of an indigenous managed, uh, like protected areas to make sure the species recovery efforts incorporate their knowledge and traditional biodiversity. Um, ecology depends on uh, uh, on biodiversity and, and that's how nature works and we've really gone against nature um, in our last hundred years or so. 
um, in Canada. Also, we need to really uh, make sure we take care of our invasive species. I know there's a lot of work in Port Coquitlam with knotweed right now, uh, but we need to really get on top of that too. Um, you look, at, look, look up knotweed. It's amazing the destruction it can do. Um, we really need to get on that. Thank you, Christina. And now we'll hear from Sarah. I also want to thank uh, Finn Donnelly for his work on the oceans, but I do want to um, emphasize that um, it was the Liberal government that brought in the shark fin ban under the new Fisheries Act, um, and it was the Liberal government that is promising to move um, the open net pen salmon farming to closed containment systems, and it's the Liberal government that has brought in a $142 million BC Salmon Restoration Fund, and it's the Liberal government that's brought in a $167 million Wales Initiative, and it's the Liberal government that's brought in a $1.5 billion Oceans Protections Plan, the largest investment in Canadian oceans uh, in history of Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to all candidates for your answers to that question. Okay, so the final question before our break is to do with pollution and toxic substances. What will you do to ensure that Canadians are better protected from, um, from the health and environmental impacts of toxic substances? Will you commit to strengthening the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and the Pest Control Products Act? And first up, we have Ron McKinnon. Thank you. So we know that all Canadians deserve a healthy environment and safe communities. And over the past four years, our government took significant measures to protect Canadians from toxic chemicals and pollution. This includes banning asbestos in Canada, banning microbeads from toiletries. We have announced we will be moving to ban harmful single-use plastics by 2021. We took action to improve air quality and cut pollution from industrial sources, and we improved the transparency around air quality through a new state-of-the-air report with provinces. Uh, going forward, we, we to better protect uh, Canadians from toxins, and other pollutants, uh, we elected Liberal government will move forward to further strengthen Canada's Environmental Protection Act. I'd also like to um, mention to, uh, Finn's bill, uh, the uh, closed containment bill. Uh, I actually supported that bill. Unfortunately, it was defeated by the Parliament. However, we're getting there. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Ron. Um, next, we'll go to Sarah. So Ron has discussed a fair bit of the work that we've done, but I also want to add to that the fact that we're phasing out coal by 2030, and not just that, we are leading a global coalition um, uh, called uh, Powering Past Coal, where we're working with countries around the world to phase out coal all around the, all around the world. Um, I do want to also emphasize, um, when the Conservatives were in power, um, they gutted the Fisheries Act. So 2.5 million rivers, uh, lakes, watersheds that were protected under the Fisheries Act dwindled down to just 159. Uh, we restored that through the new Fisheries Act, and we've put in so many other programs like uh, banning the microbeads, like the single-use plastics, um, in order to make sure that uh, we reduce the amount of toxins uh, in our waterways. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next, we'll hear from Brad Nickerson. So first, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> first, yes, I will commit to strengthening the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and the Pest Control Products Act. Um, the overall vision of the Green Party is uh, to protect the rights of a healthy environment for all Canadians. We take the precautionary principle and use, um, use it as a guide when making decisions about approvals of substances and pro uh, projects where there's no scientific proof of safety. Um, we, we plan to strengthen the CPA, limit approval for toxic chemicals that affect health and environment, and regu regulate microfibers as toxic substances. We hope to legislate the right to a healthy environment, including public participation rights, transparency in decision making, wider access to judicial review in court. And I, I'm running out of time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Um, next, we'll go to Jason Chabot. 
by de-emphasizing CO2 and putting the focus back on actual pollution, we'll be able to deal with uh, toxic substances like heavy metals. Uh, I just want to reference a New York Times article in 19, uh, 2019, May 12th, by Amy Yee. In Tanzania, there is no training for hazardous materials. Laborers who collect lead acid batteries used in rooftop solar systems frequently break them open with machetes and drain acid into the ground by hand. They sell those batteries to factories and they melt the scrap into furnaces to be resold to dealer, dealers. In Germany, where windmills and solar panels have a 30% operation cycle, the green energy is backed up by gas and coal-fired power plants. And now the, the plan is to shut down new safe nuclear power plant. In BC, hydroelectricity rates are 9.1 cents per kilowatt hour. Germ Germany's is 46 cents. That's five times BC's. Not right now, Germany's seniors and, and pensioners are having a hard time to decide between having heat or food. Thank you, Jason. And we'll um, go to Bryce Watts next. So, as Brad said, the Green Party of Canada will strengthen the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and the Pest, Pest Control Products Act. The problem with the Pest Control Products Act is that companies like Monsanto can make small changes to their products, repatent them under new names, and then continue using them. Products are banned by the regulatory bodies, but as soon as they get a new patent and a new name, with a small change, the same chemicals are being put into our waterways. We need to increase the funding for these regulatory boards and give the people that work with them the resources needed to go after these companies and stay up to date. These companies are making billions a year and they have the research teams to be able to go around the system and get away with whatever they're able to. We need a government board that is equipped and with the same strength that these companies have to go against the changing attitudes and the changing product names that they're able to get away with. Thank you, Bryce. Um, next, we'll hear from Benita Zarillo. Thank you. Yes, the NDP is committed to strengthening the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. I wanted to talk a little bit again about what I've been doing and what I will do around the uh, health question here. Um, some of you may know that I'm a cancer survivor. I had breast cancer, uh, not genetic. I don't think uh, it was anything that had to do with uh, my lifestyle, um, but I think it does have to do with the environment. And there's too many of us suffering from cancer. It's affecting too many people and too many families. So when I saw the vape come on the market and they started selling vape in our community back in around 2015, I took this on as something I wanted to protect our um, kids from, for sure. And uh, I'm gonna do that. That's gonna be my first point of business when I get to Ottawa. In fact, I've been working on it for almost four years. For the first three years, all I heard was, no, 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 it's, it's, gonna, it's safe, it's, it's gonna be good. Uh, I'm gonna work on the uh, Vape and Tobacco Act, number one, when I get to Ottawa, protect our kids. Too many have already died. Thank you, Benita. And Christina, we'll, we'll move to you now. Um, so yes, to the environmental, <laughs> Protection Act, of course, we would strengthen that. We'll also en enshrine into law the right to a healthy environment to ensure all communities can enjoy a guarantee to clean water, land, and air by putting in place a federal environmental bill of rights. Uh, a few things, uh, one, one unique thing that uh, I don't know if it comes up very often, but it does for me is pharmaceutical disposal. Um, I would like to get an education program uh, out there for people that are flushing away their medications or throwing them into landfills. Um, and uh, make those companies that produce uh, pharmaceuticals responsible for what happens to their product and getting that message out um, of what to do and how to handle those things. By the way, it's take it to your pharmacist and they can dispose of it properly. Um, I would look at making sure, well, we have a promise to have clean drinking water for all um, First Nations uh, by 2021. Um, and uh, we need to tackle our recycling issues. I don't know if you saw the documentary last week on that, but I was quite shocked that we aren't actually recycling only 10% of our goods. Thank you, Christina. And thanks again to all candidates for your insightful answers. Okay, so I think this gives us a really good background into where our candidates stand on some of the key issues with respect to the environment and climate change. We're now going to take a 10 minute break and I ask you once again to please bring your questions down as quickly as you can. Um, take the opportunity to stretch your legs and we'll see you back at 8.10. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, to the second half of our climate debate. Um, and for this half, I just first want to mention, please do not open that side door. You'll set off the alarm and we'll all be in big trouble. Um, I got the, the word. Um, so welcome back. And for this half, I um, would like to introduce my colleague, Adam Bremner Akins, who will be moderating the second half of the debate. Adam is a graduating student from Terry Fox Secondary. He's a climate activist, and he's been involved in the organization of nonpartisan cross-party climate strikes. He is currently pursuing so uh, studies in social justice and political science with plans to go on to university and study political science and environmental science. And we're delighted to have Adam here with us tonight to moderate the second half of our debate. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Well, welcome back. We will now be moving on to the portion of our debate where candidates will be answering questions from the audience. I will read the question, then the chosen candidate will have one minute to respond. The candidates will then have the an a choice to respond to that question with a 30 minute second, a 30 second period. Good. 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can talk about it. I was born in Barhead, Alberta. <laughs> Yeah, if they would like to, if you guys would like to respond, just raise your hand and uh, you will be chosen to respond. Now for the first question. Actually, I would first like to start by reading this out. We got this question from a nine-year-old boy in the audience, and it says, "I don't want to, I don't want a bad life when I grow up because I'm only nine years old." So I think that sort of puts into perspective how important this issue is to everybody here. Yeah. Now, can, can you ask me that again? Or ask oh yeah. So uh, no, I haven't asked the question oh. yet. No. <laughs> This question is directed to you, Brett Nickerson. Yes. How will you transition us to a clean economy, transport energy, agricultural, while protecting us from job loss? Okay. okay. All, right. All right. How will we transition to, um, help me again, sorry, I'm thinking fast. How will fast. you transition us to a clean economy, transport energy, and agricultural included, while protecting us from job loss? Okay, so that's, a, that's out of the Green Party. That, that, that forces me to the Green Party platform. Um, the, 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 the biggest issue that a lot of people are frightened of is all of a sudden we'll put all sorts of people out of work. This is a transition and yes, people will um, lose a job, but we are committed to a just transition so that we can train them for other, um, for other jobs, other opportunities that will come up. People who are working as pipe fitters right now, uh, steel workers, there are jobs in geothermal. They're, they're, directly, they're directly transferable skills. They're, um, I'm running out of time again, but 10 seconds. So that, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Brad. Seeing as no candidates want to respond to that, the next question will be, oh, Sarah, yeah. You, you have a 30 minute, uh, I mean 30 second period to respond. To him or to him? Uh, to him. No, you, you uh, just respond to his comments if you'd like. <laughs> oh, well you have the next question. Yeah, so this question is, how will you protect the rights of indigenous people with respect to issues such as clean drinking water and the environment? So this is a very important issue, obviously, and um, I, wa I wanted to take the time to take a deep dive into it and to understand what's been done so far and what's planned to be done. So when the Liberal government came into power, there were 105 uh, long-term water boil advisories that hadn't been taken care of. Um, as of right now, 88 of those have, the, have been resolved, and we're well on our way. Uh, by March uh, 2021 to get rid of all of them. There's over 300, I think actually more, more than 400 projects that have already been implemented in terms of water and sanitation. And there's been um, a, a significant investment and a promise to continue this work going forward. 
Um, myself, I was a water and sanitation engineer when I was working for the Red Cross and for Doctors Without Borders in remote communities. And I know how hard it is to bring this technology in remote places. I would love to be the Member of Parliament because I think I can actually uh, provide technical solutions myself because I've already done it in places like Chad, Congo, Philippines uh, for remote communities that needed this kind of work. Thank you, Sarah. The next, oh, yes? Yes, you can. My question would be to um, the Liberal candidate. If, if you were in government, would you have made the choice of a $4.5 billion investment in the Kinder Morgan pipeline before investing in clean water? And if you know about sanitation that happens in, uh, in other countries, could those same sanitation projects not have been uh, implemented here as a stop that gap? But really, would you have made that decision for the 4.5 to go to pipeline rather than water? Sure. So the thing about the $4.5 billion invested on the pipeline is that it's a product that's already moving. And some people um, have said that moving that product by rail car is preferred to moving it by pipeline. I think that's very irresponsible. Um, the federal government should um, consider that moving uh, something by pipeline, uh, it's, it's better for the safety of people. We've seen over the last couple of years, the amount of oil moving by rail car has increased by three to four times. Um, in, in terms of my experience, I would, oh, sorry, yes, I would love to be in the government so that I can tell them about the clean technologies for water, yes. Anybody else would like the chance to respond? Jason. My only concern is, uh, is, is, the motive to, is the motive to enhance their capabilities of participating more in the country, or are we, are we ignoring that they're in their own part of the country? Is, is there something that we can do that gets them to participate in the, in the Canadian economy? Is, is that a focus that we will have in our policy? Yes, so the Liberal government already has significantly involved uh, First Nations communities um, throughout um, Canada in the various projects. Um, we've heard uh, the Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Bellegarde, say that the Liberal government has done more for the First Nations in the last 50 years than any other government, and the, 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 the Prime Minister constantly says that this is the most important relationship that we have. Um, we've seen in project and project again and again, uh, whether it's on uh, oceans or waterways or fish, that we make sure that we not only get their uh, uh, input, but we involve them from the ground up because they have the unique solutions for their own um, communities. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, Christina. So the rationale to buy a pipeline because we're already making the product that goes in it falls a little flat. It, what's really happening is we are expanding that which is the opposite direction we should be going in. And that $4.5 billion would be so much better spent in clean technology and renewable energy. Thank you, we're gonna move on to our next question now. Uh, we're, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we're moving on to our next question now. Yeah, thank you. No, we're, we're moving on for time's sake, just so we can get to as many questions as we can. Thank you. The next question is addressed to Ron McKinnon. How can you support a pipeline, LNG facility, and TMX, and also be a climate leader? And will you change subsidi subsidies for these industries? Can you say back about the subsidies? Will you change subsidies for these industries? We are already uh, scheduled to phase out all, um, almost all fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. The ones that are not uh, included in that are the ones to remote communities that uh, help them to buy fuel for their um, generating stations and so forth in, in the remote communities. But we have also committed to get all of the remote communities on renewable clean power since um, by 2030. Um, the, the rest of this question is far more than I can do in the last, next 30 seconds. So um, I happy, I'm happy to deal with this question uh, I, I support the TMX pipeline, the, the expansion. I, uh, 
Um, the, uh, the LNG pipeline is not actually federal jurisdiction, but I support it as well because it's good for the climate and good for the environment in a, in a global sense. Um, it's part of the transition that we need to make. Uh, so is a TMX. We, we can actually make our climate commitments with TMX in the, in the, um, in the picture. Thank you, Ron. Uh, yes, Brad Nickerson and then to Sarah. Just, could, did I just hear did I just hear you say that the pipeline is good f in a global sense? I said that the uh, LNG pipeline was good in a global sense because it takes LNG to um, uh, offshore places such as China where they can phase out coal. Um, one of the problems with LNG at the moment is it does take, a, there is a lot of uh, fugitive methane release during the process of, uh, of um, retrieving the, harvesting the gas. That's one of the things that the province is working on going forward. That is one of the things that we are working forward to going, uh, working on going forward, as well as electrifying that process as well. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Badier, would you like to comment? Yeah, um, so I know that the, the emissions from the green uh, from the pipeline are uh, two percent of our total uh, greenhouse gas emissions here in Canada, and by contrast, the transportation sector, for example, is twenty five percent. Can you put into perspective um, the amount of uh, work that we're doing just in the transportation sector, so that people can know just the ratio um, of uh, the scale of the, the impact of the pipeline? Um, because I know that overall, our the reduction in the emissions from our environmental plans are equal to taking 20 of these pipelines out of service, just to put it in perspective. So thank you, what Sarah. are some of the things we're doing on, on transportation? Well, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> the next question will be for Bryce Watts. Oh, for the, uh, no, the next statement will be for Bryce Watts. Do I get to answer that? Um, no, sorry, it's Bryce Watts. <laughs> so, Ron, I have a question for you, though. Because he, he, he raised his hand to comment on the next. If Ron would like to, I don't. I don't. Uh, Ron can respond afterwards. Yeah, my question is for Ron, so he can answer both if you'd like. Uh, so you've said 2025 is when the Liberal government's committing to remove the subsidies for oil and gas industry. So that's an expectation that you're asking Canadians to vote for you two more times to live up to the promise that you're making now. When promises that have already been made have been broken, how can you get us to believe in that? Do I get to answer this question? Yes, you can answer both. <laughs> okay. We committed long ago to, to phase out the, uh, the um, subsidies on fossil fuel. We have been working forward on that process. These are not things you just turn off at the, at the flick of a switch. There are contracts, there are, there are uh, um, government programs that have been instituted over decades where people are expecting this money. You don't repudiate your contracts um, at the drop of a hat. So we're phasing them out in a responsible way and we will get them done um, by 2025. It, with the exception being the uh, remote communities and isolated communities who currently depend on fossil fuels for generating their electricity. And once again, we will phase those out by 2030. Thank you, Ron. Um, Thank you. We have time for one more uh, response. Would anybody like to take it? Yes, it's Sarah Badier. So, I mean, I won't bother asking a question because he's probably not going to have time to answer it. And I'll just say eight out of nine subsidies and the tax code have already been removed and we're well on our way. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is for Jason Chabot. How do you propose to hold companies accountable for their pollution? Examples include toxins in the water and our garbage disposals. Uh, whenever I look at questions and answers like this, I'm always thinking, how are we, how are we gonna lift Canada up in these ventures that we're on. So when I asked the questions earlier, it's just, okay, if we use something to make a uh, people group work, can we work towards a goal of making Canada stronger? As far as uh, holding companies accountable for their pollution and so on, it, really what you got to do is you got to have an economy that attracts them to want to even be in the country first. And when they want to be in the country, they're going to want to take care of their country. It's just like a family. When somebody is invited, invited into a family, they want what's best for that family. It's, it's hard to, to just discipline people, but the more important thing that you want to focus on is, is saying, okay, here's what we want to do. We want to work together. And I think that's what's missing as well in government. They, people want to see the, the government see, they want to see the government work together like that towards goals as well. So companies, if uh, 
they can hold their mission in place where they care about the environment, they'll actually care for their employees Thank as well. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Would anybody like to respond to that? Nope. Okay, moving on. The next question is for Bryce Watts. Do we need to wait for 2030 to close coal plants? What innovations are planned to reduce emissions in the short term? So this goes back to the subsidies question again. If we remove those subsidies, that's $3.3 billion we have access to every single year. If we want to remove coal power from this country and want to shift to a greener energy production, we have $3.3 billion that we could be putting towards research and innovation. Research and innovation that was cut by the Harper government and continue to be cut by the Liberal government. This money can be put back to use and given to research councils so that they can find the solutions to the problems that we're facing today and transition us to this green technology. Thank you very much. Would anybody, wouldn't anybody like to respond? Nope. Uh, the next question is for Christina Gower. How will you convince Canadians about the, se the severity of the climate crisis? I mean, to be honest, I think most Canadians are convinced. Um, <laughs> I'm not, you know, we, we had a, a debate the other day and, and they, you know, most debates, uh, in my opinion, are people attend that are just mostly there to cheer for their candidate, but we just did the chamber one and there was 68% had not decided who they're voting for. And I think that the key to, to that massive change in outlook is the climate. It's it's disturbing that we've had the same parties back and forth and we've ended up somewhere that we want to change. And I think it's a change year. And I, I think Canadians are well aware of that. Um, I, I think there is a propaganda that is uh, spewed out by oil companies, definitely. I think that once we instill hope and uh, allay the fears of oil workers and, and show them that we're going to give them good jobs uh, in renewable energy or energy sources, then I think that will slow that uh, down. Thank you very much. Anybody would like to respond? Okay, moving on. The next question is, oh, sorry, Jason. Uh, obviously, my concern would only be that uh, silent majority that they've either, they're not going to vote because it doesn't matter anymore. So. Is there ways of reaching out to those people so that we actually encourage them to, to vote because their vo voice does indeed matter? Is there ways that you can go after people that have just said, it's not going to work, I don't want to vote anymore? Strategies for that. Would anybody like to respond to that? Bryce Watts. It's called consistent science-based messaging and it's called the Green Party of Canada. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would anybody else like the chance to respond? No? Okay, we're moving on. The next question is for Benita Zirillo. Regarding water, what will you do to clean ocean uh, plastic in the ocean, and how will you support the transition to closed containment fishing? Benita. Well, I, uh, part, of that, part of that work is well underway. Is that good, Bill? Is that working? Uh, part of that work is w well underway, and I will be supporting. Is it off now? I will be dis supporting the NDP's uh, commitment to the uh, closed containment on the land, and uh, I'm happy and proud to say that it was the member of parliament from this very riding that has been the leader on this file for years and years and years. And I look forward to continuing that stewardship in, in this in this riding here in Port Moody, Coquitlam, and Moore Belkira. Thank you very much. Would anybody like a chance to respond? Sarah. I'd, I'd just really like to know how what you'd like to do is different from what's already being done. Well, we're actually going to do it and we're prioritizing it. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to the next question now. This is for Ron McKinnon. What will you be able to do to work with Conservatives? And how will you fund all of these changes? To work with the Conservatives about what? Uh, is not specify. Okay. <laughs> Despite what you see in question period, parliamentarians get along fairly well. And I've worked with many Conservatives on committees 
where we, we achieve common purpose. Uh, I know that there's a fellow by the name of Len Weber, who's running in Calgary somewhere, uh, he's a conservative candidate, he, he promoted a, a bill for uh, um, organ donations. And we, on the committee, the health committee, we 100% support it. It was supported, I believe, unanimously in the House. There are all kinds of opportunities to work together with the opposition to achieve common purpose. Um, apart from the theater of question period, which um, is fun when you don't have to do it year upon year, but um, it's not the reality of, of what Parliament's like. Thank you very much, Ron. Would anybody like a chance to respond? Okay, moving on to the next question. This is for Bryce Watts. In Canada, 520 plants and animals are listed as at risk. What will you do to change this? So we need to work with researchers once again to identify these ecologically rich uh, habitats in the country and protect them for future. If we, don't fi if we don't find the systems to protect, the animals that call it home will not be protected. Helping one species will help that one particular species, but if we don't protect the ecosystem itself, then that and all the other species that call it home will be in danger. So we need to have a base system where the ecology of the area is protected, not just a singular species. Thank you very much, Bryce. Uh, sorry, Sarah, I've been told uh, to ignore your rebuttals for now as you've spoken quite a bit so far. So we're just trying to get equal uh, speaking time among the candidates. The next question is for Benita Zarillo. What is your party's policy to invest more in public transit and move away from private vehicles? Sure, well, there's, there's two uh, main factors there. One is to make it more affordable. Um, my family... Uh, lives in Europe, I grew up in Europe, it's, it's much more affordable in Europe, it's become a European lifestyle, regardless of age, uh, to be using public transit, so that's something that the NDP is working towards, is uh, getting to the point where s some transit will be free. Uh, and the second is to invest in electric uh, public transit, so we have a plan to uh, reduce our emissions and to, to get electric pu pu uh, public transit expanded. Thank you very much, Benito. Would anybody aside from Sarah like to respond to the question? <laughs> I've been told Yeah, that's really not fair at all. Well, I, I guess we can change it, but I've just been told by the timekeepers this. That's not fair. Okay. Sure, we'll let her speak. It just means I'm prepared and I have answers. Then speak. Yeah, no, no, I will let you speak now. Okay. I mean, I. I think if it's a debate, people shouldn't be afraid of, of being asked, right? I'm, so anyways, yeah, I'm just here to... No problem, uh, yeah. no problem. I understand. Um, so the Liberal government has already invested $4 billion in public transit just in the Lower Mainlands in the last four years. Um, and they're already said that there's $5,000 rebates for electric vehicles, and they've already said that there's billions of dollars of green infrastructure funds for municipalities so that they can have um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I mean, there's a lot of that already there. So how is that different from what you're planning? No, that was provincial. Oh. Would anybody like to respond? Again. <laughs> We're going to do it. I mean, I don't know how to answer any differently than it's about priorities and actually doing it. So Sorry, can we have some call? Uh, we're not trying to express opinions right now in the audience, so if you could just refrain from. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina. Just a couple of points. Um, I didn't hear if you actually said this, but um, the public transportation, we'd like to make it free where we can, but also, uh, if not, on a sliding scale according to income, so it's more equitable. Um, and one of the first things that we will do in office also is build a electric vehicle corridor straight across the country so that you can move your goods and services immediately and people can have that incentive of um, feasibility to drive an electric vehicle right across the country. Thank you, Christina. I'm sorry, we're not taking questions from the audience currently. If, if the audience could just uh, remain silent for this portion of the debate, please. There, there will be, candidates will be here after to answer your questions. Would there be, uh, any Ron? In answer to uh, Benita, who says they're going to do it, we are doing it. 
We, are, we have been doing so for four years. We, we will continue to do it. We've been investing in public transit. We've been investing in, in infrastructure for electric cars. We have been giving subsidies for electric, electric cars. So we are doing it. We will continue to do so. Thank you. And I'm just going to follow that up with, I, I think I mentioned I'm a city councillor, and it falls on the municipality and it falls on the development community to put the infrastructure in place. And at this point in time, I can speak specifically for Coquitlam that no matter what the federal government is in putting in place as far as in subsidies for cars, if the, if the municipality doesn't prioritize or doesn't have the budget for the infrastructure, it can't happen. So at the end of the day, there is a current disconnect between what the federal government is doing and what's happening on the ground, and municipalities are desperately in need of stable funding from the federal government for transit Thank you. infrastructure. I'm sorry, Sarah. Christina wanted to go first. So we'll, we'll have one more question on this and we'll move on to the next question. I was just going to actually say kind of the similar thing. I met with TransLink a while back and, and they don't have stable funding um, for their whole plan. So they, you can't, making a four-year plan at a time for something so massive as our rapid transit and our public transportation systems, uh, it's very difficult to do, so we would instill um, and legislate funding so that they can have a consistent budget carried over term. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> Sorry, I we're like moving to on to the next too, question. I'm again, sorry. we're talking about reality um, of what's happening on the ground and what's actually affecting people's lives. Thank you lives, very much, Benita. We're moving on to the next question now. This is for Jason Chabot. Will you accept more climate refugees into the country? When when dealing with immigration, the, the best thing people can be aware of is the difference between fraud and legal immigration. And what I've done my best to do is to try and explain to people the difference between those two, because often what happens is fraud is equated as immigration. And so when we're talking about people that will overstay a visa or they'll cross the border and they won't show up for their asylum court date because they've been offered a job for cash, the concern there is not the person that's doing that that's across the border, it's overstated visa, it's the employer. And when we're doing that part of the business, that's where we can actually take care of the true refugee and the true uh, immigrant. Because at that point, we'll be able to take care of all the people that are stepping ahead of people that are trying to do things legally. So when you talk about refugee crisis, when you talk about asylum claimants, the key is to preserve the integrity of those words. And that's what I've strived to do. That's what I've attempted to do every breath of my life uh, is just to bring attention to people so that when we are looking at uh, what our country is capable of doing, we are seen as that country that people do want to come to legally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron? I think the concept of bogus refugees versus true refugees is appalling. Refugees are refugees. They're people who need help. They come here. We need to try to help them. People who come here and ask for help who, are, who do not have a legitimate claim, their claim will be rejected and they will be uh, deported from the country. But we, we must recognize that refugees, immigrants, they're the lifeblood of our economy. We need them to grow, we need them to thrive. So we have to uh, absolutely uh, respect them and, and do what we can to help refugees Thank you, Ron. from wherever they come. The next uh, response will be from Brad Nickerson. I have a direct question back to Jason with regards to his comment. Um, recently in an article, especially with regards to refugees, um, recently in an uh, article about the, this, the ice shelf in the Antarctica, they talked about the, that ice shelf completely melting at a much faster rate than it ever has. They're talking about a, a sea level rise. The science, by the way, the science talks about a sea level rise of 20 meters. That means that there will be people in Indonesia that their, their entire, well, not their entire country, but a great portion of their country will be underwater. That, that is in a great deal because of the things that the Western world's doing. Thank you, Brad. We're going to see, we're going to see. Your time is up. How do you plan to deal with climate Would anybody else like to respond? I can. <laughs> 
again, we're, we're talking about legal refugees. I've got no, no concern with legal refugee. I'm, I'm just, again, bringing up the fact that when we have our limited resources as it is in the forms of our Canadian Border Security Services Agency, they're there to protect us, they're there to keep us safe from people that do want to do us harm. And how we identify those people is through our legal matters. And so if it comes down to the businesses, again, are breaking our Immigration and Refugee Protection Act by hiring people that are not legally allowed to work in the country, we've got to call that out and we've got to deal with those instances because when you don't deal with law and order, it trickles and ripples so that now we can't deal with legal refugees and we need to be able to have those resources to deal with the Thank true you, refugees. Thank you, uh, Ron McKinnon. I'd just like to point out that every newcomer to Canada, every refugee, every immigrant, goes through a number of very serious, strenuous security checks. They're investigated by, by uh, CBSA, by um, the RCMP, by Interpol, by uh, CSIS, in, in fact, so that the, the, the chances of a, of a in, in fact, the number of um, irregular, irregular uh, entry people what do we call those people? Uh, irregular entrants um, that have any kind of serious criminality is, is like 0.03%. Thank you, Ron. 0.3%, yes. And those are found and they're, uh, and they're sent home. Um, Jason, I know it comes from a good place, but um, we were former refugees in my family, right? And yes, we came through the legal way, um, but I know that having worked internationally, I've seen uh, in typhoons in the Philippines, in malnutrition camps in Chad and Congo, climate change is really making people's lives miserable, and they need to have a place to go to. Um, and so, you know, when they come here, um, they contribute. My parents are care aides in the Tri-Cities. They take care of physically and, and, and uh, f uh, uh, disabled people. Thank you um, very much, And Sarah. they've contributed to society their whole life. So there are people that we can help and they can help them. Okay, we're gonna be moving on to our last question of the night. This is for Bryce Watts. Do you support bringing federal laws and policies in line with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People? Yes, 100%. The role of the United Nations is specifically to provide guidelines for other countries to take part in. These guidelines are made up of internationally recognized cooperative programs and they're built upon a collab collaborative and cooperative dialogue between countries. Indigenous people around the world need to have their voices heard. They cannot be ignored any longer. 80% of biodiversity is within traditional territories of indigenous peoples and it needs to be respected. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like the chance to respond? Run. Yes, I was uh, very proud to support uh, my MDP colleague, colleague uh, Romeo Saganash's bill, which uh, formalized that process, that, and, and actually the, the whole Liberal caucus, the Liberal government as well, supported it as well. Um, unfortunately, it did die in the Senate because um, certain conservative senators were playing, uh, playing games with legislation. So a number of very, very good bills died in the Senate. Um, but I absolutely support the continued uh, implementation, the, com the continued review of all of our laws to bring them in into compliance with UNDRIP. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Benita? So uh, I have a question. Um, I'm going to... Can I ask it from someone else in my writing? I'd like to ask uh, MP or Ron McKinnon. I'd like to ask Ron. Yeah, you can, can ask do that Ron cross writing. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm going to ask is, how will this manifest on the ground in municipalities? Because every year I go to the United Nations for Commission on the Status of Women. I've been on the Indigenous Relations Committee at Metro Vancouver for over five years. I'm also on the Fraser Valley, Valley Regional one, and we don't talk about this on the ground. So how is this going to filter down to the, the, the mis municipalities where they have to take responsibility to uh, uh, also adopt this principle? How is that going to happen? How are they going to make that work? Because it sure hasn't happened yet. I think it's important to show leadership at the federal level, but it's also, the, it's also important to see this implemented at, each pro in, at the provincial level in each province and territory. 
and that will filter down. It, it needs to filter down, obviously, to the to the municipal level. Uh, and I think it, it really is is an opportunity for municip municipal leaders to step up and 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 uh, pr promote this kind of activity at the municipal level as well. Uh, yes, we'll have one more uh, response from Bonita, and then we'll move yeah. on. Yeah. Just a quick response, to that. and that's the problem with this kind of thing because at the municipal level, it's an internal. Uh, push and pull, if you have a progressive council, maybe they will do something. If you don't, they won't. And unfortunately, in Coquitlam, we don't have a progressive council. It doesn't allow us to do this type of thing. Thank you, Benita. That was our last question. Now, I would like to thank all the candidates for their responses tonight. I have learned a lot, and I hope that all of you have as well. I hope that this has informed you more about the candidates themselves and their party policies. Now, I would like to give each candidate one minute to wrap up their thoughts and give some key points on why the public deserves your vote. We'll start with Sarah, and we'll move down to Brad. No. Sorry, I've made a mistake here. Yes, yes. We will start with Bryce. So this election, we have a real opportunity to make a change in this country. We've been told the same thing over and over every single election for the last 153 years. We go between conservative and liberals. When we're unhappy with one, we're switching to the next to get the other out. That is not what needs to happen. We need to have actual voices for the varied people in this community. This is a community of multiculturalism. Why do we have only two voices on the national stage? This is our final chance to have real elected leaders who take the climate crisis seriously. This event specifically is for addressing the environmental crisis. The the marches that happened two weeks ago were specifically for hundreds of thousands of Canadians to have their voices heard to show that the climate crisis is the top issue that they're thinking about. We all know that the Conservatives or Liberals will most likely form a minority government, but I can guarantee you on a local level that I will be the thorn in their side to make sure they do not break their promises to us and that they keep the promises to fight for the climate. I will do that. Remember on October 21st, Bryce Swans. Thank you, Bryce. We'll now move on to Christina. So we keep voting in the same two parties and expect a different result. The Liberals and Conservatives will not solve the climate crisis, nor will they solve our fantastically unjust distribution of wealth crisis. We're at a critical point in our history, and we still have the ability to change what we see in front of us. So many great innovations are out there. We just need to empower the people to put them to use. The NDP offers the only comprehensive plan to urgently address our climate crisis. I myself find it hard to participate in preventing climate change on a personal level. I work 12-hour shifts. I work overtime. I ride my bike. That makes it a 15-hour day. At least I'm doing that. I shop on the outside of the, the you know, grocery stores and buy local. But, but the bigger stuff, it's really hard for all of us because we're overworked and we're overcommitted and we are busy with our children, our aging parents. Um, these are the reasons why we need a comprehensive deal that takes care of the people along with the planet and makes sure we don't leave the people behind. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. We'll now move to Brad. <laughs> Just about wiped everything out. Okay. Respectfully, it's not just the same two parties. The traditional parties are all con uh, connected to the oil and gas industry. They all are. It's a question of trust. None of us in general are qualified to refute the statements made by climate state scientists, either in favor or against the stance on anthropogenic, anthropogenic global warming. So it comes down to who do you trust? I trust scientists. I trust the Royal Society of Canada, their fellow signatories in the Joint Statement on Climate Change, Austra the Australian Academy of Science, the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Sciences and the Arts, the Brazilian Academy of Science, the Royal Society of Canada, the Caribbean Academy of Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, all of the other 10 Academies of Sciences, the academies of the G7, IPCC, NASA, NOAA, the Pentagon, all major universities. We trust Thank the scientific you, consensus in all other topics, and we use cell phones, GPS, airplanes, MRIs, CAT scans. It's all the same. Thank you, Brad, for your closing statement. It's all the same math. We'll now be moving on to Ron. Why, why on earth did you choose 
to ignore the science on those things on this subject? So the focus of uh, tonight's discussion has been on environmental issues, which I think are very much on the minds, top of mind for Canadians. And I would argue that this government has delivered on an extremely ambitious environmental agenda over the past four years. For example, and we're building on this in our, in our platform going forward. So for example, a new Fisheries Act which restored lost protections from the Harper changes in 2012. A new environmental assessment program which will be very significant. A detailed climate plan to provide a path to the achievement of Canada's Paris targets. Significant progress on achieving the marine and terrestrial protected areas. Uh, significant investments in habitat restoration, including a new $142 million uh, fund um, in BC to restore salmon habitat. Uh, significant focus and work on species at risk issues, including the Chinook salmon, the caribou and south resident killer whales. A plastic strategy that includes bringing in a ban on harmful single-use plastics by 2021. Significant reinvestments in the scientific capacity of the DFO. Thank you, Ron. We'll and now be moving on to Sarah. If you really care about climate change, we cannot afford to be divided on this issue. And we have to unite against the Conservatives because the Conservatives, if they come to power, they're going to undo all of the hard work that we've put into place. All that momentum will be gone. The carbon tax and the clean fuel standards will be gone. The investments in public transit and clean tech and electric vehicles will be gone. Our investments in oceans and salmon and trees and endangered species will be gone and that is moving backwards. I have been a fighter for communities in the most difficult circumstances. I have negotiated solar systems and clean technology solutions with adversarial governments and war zones and I've succeeded. I want to bring that decade of experience here as your member of parliament to bring clean tech and the new age, the new frontier of where we're going on this front. For the sake of my daughter and all of your kids, let's make sure we make a decision that we don't regret in 20 years. Let's keep the Conservatives out. My name is Sarah Badia, and I will fight for this until the last day that I have. Thank you, Sarah. We'll now move on to Jason. Well, water vapor is a 90% absorption of greenhouse gas can be proved in the desert, basically, where it's deadly hot during the day and super cold at night can freeze a body. The reason why it has a CO2 concentration of 400 parts per million, but the reason why it lacks humidity is because there's just no water vapor in those areas. Now, in 2008, Al Gore predicted that ice arctic would be uh, free of arctic uh, by 2013. That didn't happen. In 1988, the Maldive Islands were going to be underwater by 2018. That didn't happen. The 97% consensus report that was derived by John Cook was done so by doing a keyword search for global warming and global climate change, which appeared in 12,000 papers. However, after peer review, only 64 papers actually had anything to do with saying that man was a chief driver of climate change. Now, if we don't deal with this problem with pipelines and de-escalate the panic and fear regarding CO2, in the next five or 10 years, we've got a separatist issue that's growing out of the West. And it's not gonna, come from Quebec as far as Canadian unity, but the answer that Canadians are going to begin to turn to when it comes to Canadian unity will be from Quebec. Thank you, Jason. We'll now Canada. move on to Benita. In this riding, the Conservatives are trying to take away this community's long-standing progressive voice, and their commitment to the climate uh, crisis is obvious by their no-show here tonight. We can't let this happen because this community cares deeply about the health and well-being of their neighbors, but also of this planet, which is shown by the crowd that's here tonight. We've got a lot to lose in this riding. The NDB, NDP have built a strong foundation with a special eye on our environment. I am ready to build on that foundation and keep advocating for the aspirations of this community. I have the governance experience needed to hit the ground running. My my government record is strong. I'm known for my integrity and, cur and courage to get things done. With my experience and your support, together we can expand on the long legacy the NDP's environmental stewardship has been in this community and to ensure the next MP will act on the climate change. And I mean act. Thank you, Benito.
I would like to thank you all for your closing statements, and I would like, us, like to bring us to the end of the debate. First, I would like to personally thank Douglas College for allowing us to use this venue, and to Tri-Cities TV for covering the event. To all the volunteers who put countless hours of their lives into this, making this event possible. I would like to thank the candidates who took time out of their lives to come to us and talk to us today. And I hope this uh, debate has informed you and will allow you now to make an informed decision in our election. The candidates will be available in the lobby until about 9.30. Please take advantage of the opportunity to ask them any further questions you may have. On that note, we'd like to say good night and thank you for coming out and please get out and vote. <laughs>